Hi guys, my name is Jack, and today we are going to review with you another horrible case. Before starting the story, I want to apologize for my bad English. I am not a native speaker. However, I am trying my best for you guys. Thanks for your understanding. Escape to Death In 2003, this high-profile story shook the whole of Brazil and was widely covered by the international media. Hundreds of law enforcers, rescuers, and volunteers from among those who cared about the story were searching for the young couple who disappeared in the forests of Embuguasu province. They had hoped to find them alive, but unfortunately those hopes were not realized, and the last days of the young people turned into a real nightmare. But grief-stricken members of the families of the missing ahead awaited another ordeal, when the main criminal, rapist, torturer, and brutal killer was not punished, moreover found himself in better conditions than he lived before. Who are Liana Friedenbach and Felipe Café? Liana Bay Friedenbach was born in Sao Paulo in May 1987. The girl was the eldest of two children at her parents. She grew up in a fairly well-known and wealthy family. The head of the family, Henry Friedenbach, was a successful lawyer and a very respected man in the city. Felipe Silva Café was also a native of Sao Paulo, where he was born in July 1984. But he was brought up in a rather modest, large family, from childhood used to work part-time, tried to provide for himself independently, and help his relatives. Young people met as schoolchildren. Between them, there was a friendship, which grew into mutual sympathy and the first youthful love, but they had to hide it in every possible way, it is worth noting that Liana's parents were religious people. They brought up their daughter in strictness. She attended Sunday school from an early age and regularly went to church. Father and mother were categorically against her romantic relationships at such a young age. In addition, social inequality also played a significant role in this matter, because the girl, as I have already said, was from a wealthy family, and her chosen one was poor. But the prohibitions of parents did not force the young people to part. They simply began to hide their affair, secretly arranging dates in different places where no one could see them, in order to spend at least a little time together. One last trip. In the fall of 2003, the lovers decided to get away from everyone for a while, taking a trip to a remote, deserted area to be alone for a while. They carefully prepared for the trip, which was to be an exciting adventure for them. And above all, the boys took care of a plausible alibi that would justify their absence and would not arouse suspicion. Felipe told his parents that he and his friends were going on a camping trip. Liana, on the other hand, could think of nothing better to say than that she was going on a sightseeing trip with the guys from church. She knew for sure that this excuse would work and her parents would let her go, no questions asked. The Friedenbach and Café families believed the stories made up by the teenagers and let their children go to their deaths without worrying about anything. Liana and Felipe were unspeakably happy. They could enjoy each other's company for a whole week without fear of inhibitions and censure from their parents. The young people decided to go to a picturesque province called Embuguasu. They took with them a tent, sleeping bags, some personal belongings, and a small stock of provisions. But the couple had practically no money, and this caused some difficulties. Being students, they had the right to free public transportation, so the guys thought out and calculated their route in advance to get to their destination by bus. Early in the morning of October 31st, the lovers met at the agreed place, taking care that no one who knew them could see them together. They took the first bus, and after reaching another city in the late evening, they spent the night right in the bus station. Then two more transports took them to their desired location, from there, they had to walk a few kilometers to a deserted, deserted place hidden in the woods where they planned to camp and spend a few days alone with each other. The day was warm and sunny, and the young people, in spite of their fatigue after the long journey, were in good spirits, joking, laughing, and making plans for their little vacation. When they reached the place marked on the map, they began to set up their modest but cozy camp, uninvited guests, 
When Liana and Philippe traveled to such a remote and secluded place, they did not take into account the fact that in those areas reigns poverty, against which crime thrives. So the appearance of well-dressed young men with large backpacks and bags did not go unnoticed. As the couple walked through the forest to the abandoned farm where they planned to stay, they caught the eye of local bandits fishing near a pond. They were Paulo Cesar de Silva Marquez, nicknamed Pernambuco, and Roberto Alves Cardoso, known as Chiampino. The latter was only 16 years old, but he was already the leader of the gang he organized. The criminals were interested in strangers, especially they liked a beautiful young girl. In addition, they decided that in their backpacks there was something to gain, and they could rob them. The bandits stealthily followed the guys and began to watch, lurking in the thickets. The lovers set up a tent, had a snack, and then began to beautify the place of their parking lot. The intruders sat in ambush until they were sure that no one else would join the young men, and they had no weapons on them. Pernambuco and Chiampino then attacked Liana and Felipe, threatening them, and the latter, frightened, did not even try to run away or fight back against the unknown assailants. Having searched all the bags and backpacks, the criminals found nothing that could interest them. Then the bandits decided that they could demand ransom for the boy and the girl from their relatives. Liana, who was scared to death, immediately confirmed that she was from a rich family and her father would give them as much money as they asked for. The criminals were happy about this turn, but since they had no experience in such cases, they did not know how to organize everything in order to stay with the money and free in the end. Prisoners. While the plan was maturing and the bandits were trying to figure out who they had in their hands and how much they could ask for their lives, they decided to hide the prisoners so they couldn't escape. Initially, they were taken to a dilapidated structure near the very farm where the boys were staying, but there were no windows or doors. It was soon decided to bring the pair to the home of one of the gang members. There, Felipe was tied up and severely beaten so that he could not make an escape and offer no resistance. That same night, all the gang members took turns taking advantage of the bound and helpless girl, finally breaking her morally. The criminals could not figure out how to demand and collect the ransom, so they simply decided to get rid of the captives and hide their bodies somewhere in the woods so that they would never be found. After torturing the boys, the next day they were taken to a deserted place in the woods. The half-dead Felipe, Pernambuco, took them deep into the forest from where a shot was heard, and then the bandit returned alone. Liana realized what had happened and that her beloved was no longer alive, although the kidnappers tried to assure her that they had released the young man. They had other plans for the beautiful young Liana. The scoundrels wanted to keep her as a plaything until they got bored with her, especially since no one had started looking for the missing boys at that time. A couple of days after her daughter's departure, her parents found out that there was no excursion trip with the guys from the church, and Liana's friends don't know where she went. The Friedenbach family guessed that their heiress had run off with her boyfriend and immediately contacted his parents to find out where their children might be. But Cafe's family was sure their son had gone camping with his buddies, so there was nothing they could do to help locate the couple. The situation was complicated by the fact that neither of the young men had been in touch for several days and their phones were turned off. Thanks to his connections and money, Henri put on their feet literally all the police in the city. Step by step, bit by bit, they managed to reconstruct the route the young people took after they had run away from home by trickery. The police soon reached Mbuguasu, where the boys got off their last bus, and further their way lay through a deserted wooded area. It was also there that their phones were last online. A large-scale search began, involving police officers, rescuers, and just concerned people who, having learned about the incident, decided to help. A large local businessman also joined the operation, providing his personal helicopter to search from the air and spreading leaflets with photos of the missing young people. Their camp was found quite quickly, and it looked frightening. Despite the lack of signs of blood and fighting, it was clear that something terrible had happened here. The couple's personal belongings had been turned out of their bags and carelessly scattered. The tent had been opened from top to bottom with a knife, and the guy's cell phones were lying around. Scouring every mile, rescuers soon discovered Philippe's breathless body. 
The tied-up guy had been shot in the back of the head almost at point-blank range, so he had no chance of being rescued. It became clear that the probability of finding Liana alive is minimal, but hope, as they say, dies last. Henry Friedenbach involved the press in the search, making sure that the whole process was widely covered in the media, and as many people as possible learned about it. For any information about Liana's whereabouts, an impressive reward was announced, but it did not help the case. The massacre of Liana. After the criminals got rid of Felipe, they brought Liana back to the house where they had previously held them both. By then, the bandits had been joined by their accomplices, Antonio Gatano da Silva and Agnaldo Pires. Ciampino proudly announced to them that Liana was his property and could do whatever he wanted with her. He invited everyone to fulfill their dirtiest fantasies with Liana, and his offer was immediately accepted. A day later, after learning about the large-scale search operation, the criminals decided to change their location and moved with the victim to the house of Anthony Matias de Barros, another member of the gang. In the evening of the same day, they went fishing, taking Liana with them. The ringleader threw his jacket over her because it was chilly outside, and he decided to show concern in this way. In the evening, the older brother of Ciampino, whom the juvenile delinquent had not told about his affairs, came to the same place. Ciampino told his brother that Liana was his lover, but he immediately recognized her as the wanted girl. He took his brother aside and said that his captive was being actively sought, so that the police were literally following them. Ciampino took his brother's words as a sign and a call to action. He decided that it was urgent to get rid of Liana and then run away and lay low. He lied to Liana, saying that she was free and he would lead her to the road. In fact, the bandit led his victim into the forest, where he brutally killed her with a knife and then smashed her head with a rock to make sure she was dead. Liana's body was not found until five days after the massacre. There was literally no life on her. She was very badly mutilated. Liana was wearing the killer's jacket, which later became one of the key pieces of evidence. The criminals were incredibly cruel, cynical, and ruthless, but at the same time, as stupid and short-sighted. They did not try to run or hide, did not bother to destroy the physical evidence, and at the same time believed that no one would ever find them. This naive self-confidence of the bandits helped the police quickly identify them and apprehend all members of the criminal gang. Ciampino, as I have already said, left his jacket on the victim's body, which had his sweat marks on it. In addition, he brought the murder weapon to his house, washed it, and hid it in the yard, while he tried to wash the clothes with traces of the murdered girl's blood so that he could continue to wear them. According to the results of DNA analysis, it was possible to identify the gang members who had committed violence against Liana. All the gang members were apprehended almost simultaneously. The ringleader not only did not deny it, but immediately began to testify, boasting that it was he who had kidnapped, abused, and then killed the unfortunate victim. He described in detail everything that had happened to Liana in the last days of her life. Following a lengthy trial, almost all of the adult members of the criminal gang received fairly harsh sentences. Pernambuca was sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of Felipe. Antonio Gatano de Silva, as well as Agnaldo Pires, also received life sentences. But Anthony Matias de Barros was sentenced to only six years in prison because he himself did not torture the victim, but provided the gang with his house, where it all took place. However, with the ringleader and the most brutal member of the gang, everything was not so simple. At the time of his crimes, he himself was barely 16 years old. For this reason, the guy was sent to a specialized prison for minors with a fairly mild regime. Ciampino made several escape attempts, behaved aggressively and inadequately, because of which he was appointed a psychiatric examination. He was found to have several mental abnormalities, which in themselves were not something dangerous, but in the sum gave a monstrous result, turning the young man into a sophisticated sadist and murderer without feelings of pity or remorse. After such a diagnosis, the criminal was transferred to a closed-type medical institution where he was to undergo compulsory treatment and rehabilitation. No further punishment was ever achieved for him, despite numerous appeals filed by the families of the murdered young men. 
As a result, Ciampino ended up in better conditions than he had been in before the crime. He now had his own private, cozy room with a large TV, internet access, and a comfortable bed with an orthopedic mattress. He has a balanced four meals a day with a customized menu, which is part of the policy of the medical facility where he is being held. His monthly maintenance is estimated at about R$12,000. That's about $2,500. In recent years, the perpetrator has regularly petitioned for his release, noting that he has undergone a full course of treatment and no longer poses any threat to others, which means he can return to his normal life. This is a monstrous story. Thanks for watching, guys. That was Jack with you. Subscribe to the channel. There are many shocking stories ahead.